good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to the first uh, lecture uh, of the innovation talk, uh, um, Winter Spring 2022 series. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor tonight to welcome uh, Christian Ferri and also Rebecca Montanari, who is uh, a colleague, professor of cybersecurity, vice rector for digital innovation at the University of Bologna, and was also for a while a teacher here, and sometimes still uh, comes to BBS. Um, welcome um, also to the students that are uh, and the uh, community members that are connected uh, through internet and video streaming. I know that uh, we had. Uh, some 400 registration, more or less. So good evening uh, to you all. Uh, we, we have been thinking for, uh, for a while if it was worthwhile to start uh, a series uh, now in January or postpone it. So we decided uh, that finally that uh, we want to continue our lives, um, uh, try to be as safe uh, as we can. Um, we opened uh, the room uh, to less than the full capacity, as you know, and uh, so some people couldn't find uh, uh, a seat here. But um, I think uh, it is uh, it is a good way to continue uh, to listen, to learn, uh, to discuss, uh, and uh, finally to spend time together. Uh, that is an essential part of what we do here at BBS. Um, I don't have. Uh, I don't want to take uh, uh, any longer time, and I don't have uh, other things that I want to say tonight. Uh, um, also because uh, I'm eager to learn about this topic that is far away from my skills and my knowledge. Um, I'd like only to thank uh, uh, Nicola Boari, who is uh, an adjunct professor in the Global MBA class that uh, made uh, this night uh, possible. and. Uh, actually helped us to start uh, uh, this uh, winter-spring series of innovation talks. Welcome again. Thank you, Krista, for being here. Thank you, Rebecca, for taking the time to spend uh, the uh, afternoon with us and helping us to bring uh, what Christian is uh, saying uh, in our topics uh, and in our world. Uh, have a nice uh, talk. Welcome everyone and uh, thanks very much for the participation in this event. It is a great pleasure for me and I think a great opportunity for Bologna Business School and our university to have Christian as an invited speaker tonight to discuss with us um, on a such important and stimulating topic. I think it is stimulating and it is, uh, is witnessed by the presence uh, this afternoon. I, I'm surprised of so many people in presence, so I'm very glad of this. The topic is a blockchain. Blockchain is a buzzword, you know, surrounded by many expectations and opportunities. Is it hype or can be considered a cornerstone, a crucial cornerstone for digitization? Why? A cornerstone that can lower the cost of trust, uh, therefore helping fostering collaboration. When we talk about blockchain, we should not only mean a set of innovative technologies, rather I think that blockchain can represent a paradigm shift that has the potential to really change the models of uh, uh, interactions about, among individuals, companies and institutions because it uh, proposes a completely disintermediated collaborative model based on decentralized trust, as Christian, I think, will clearly point out in his talk. A uh, research and advisory firm uh, such as Gartner has listed blockchain as one of the top 10 strategic technologies for the next years. 
And we all know that the disruptive entry of blockchain in, into the scene occurs with the Bitcoin. But it is worth to say that Bitcoin is not blockchain, it's just one of the most well-known cryptocurrency applications built on top of this technology. Um, blockchain is a distributed ledger technology that uh, uh, enables to build a wide range of applications independent from cryptocurrency. Blockchain, you know, has experienced a great growth uh, starting from 2009 and uh, still for the first almost 10 years, the focus has mainly been um, on um, strengthening the technology to make it more interoperable and more scalable and to design the core infrastructure building blocks. But now it is time to understand the still missing last mile for mass adoption of blockchain and to understand how to transform the blockchain technology value into business value. And I think that Christian will give us a really an important contribution along this direction. Um, the community in the field um, knows that there are still many barriers uh, for organizations uh, to increase the adoption of blockchain. There are cultural barriers due to the complexity of the technology and uh, the difficulty to understand it. There are technological barriers still to address. Um, there is le it is not uh, possible to rely on uh, advanced tools for large scale and efficient data collection over data on blockchain, for state verification and analysis, and for building really collaborative environments. There are economical barriers due to the lack of established fee models that allows us to predict and calculate transaction fees also because there are heterogeneous fee models <laughs> among blockchain platforms. And there are also legal barriers because there are some initiatives that have been proposed and promoted, but none of them are well established. So I think that Christian talk will provide us with really inspiring insights about this technology and will help us to capture the uh, innovation value of this uh, technology, giving his great uh, competence and experience in the field. So thanks again for <laughs> uh, having accepted uh, this invitation and welcome to our school. So I would like now to invite uh, Fabio Ficadenti and Domenica Cabezas uh, of the Master on Data Science and Business Analytics to introduce uh, Christian CV. Thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are Fabio Ficadenti and Domenica Cabezas, and we are both students from the BBS Master in Data Science and Business Analytics. And we are very pleased to be with you today and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Christian Ferri. Uh, Mr. Ferri holds an MBA from Cornell University. Okay. He made his career in an innovative field based on data that is also widely popular among us students of BBS Tech Masters, blockchain and crypto. The blockchain can be uh, considered as a new and secure method to deal with data transaction in a structured, structured open and transparent way so that everyone in the peer-to-peer -peer community can check and validate any bit of information. <coughs> Even though from calculators, this, te this technology has contributed to enrich the sense of community among us students. In fact, uh, since almost every one of us <coughs> is, interest, uh, is interested in this field, we always have a crypto to discuss about. Um, Mr. Ferry is a former PwC technology leader, serial entrepreneur, and renowned 
world expert in blockchain, tokenization, and digital currencies, who has keynoted over 120 presentations around the world, including at the World Economic Forum, Standards and Poor's, Global Plats, and others. He is also routinely being asked to provide clarity about the performance of crypto market and the technological advancement of DLT by governments and prominent media outlets, including CNBC, CNN, BBC, and many others. Since 2014, Christian has been advising over 35 companies, including Atari, Lottery.com, Swarm Fund, and others, by providing guidance on strategic planning, business growth, funding strategy, tokenization, and blockchain adaptation. Today, we, the data science and tech master students in general, are honored to dig deeper into these subjects we are learning in class. Mr. Ferry's experience can only stimulate our curiosity and willingness to dive into new challenges. Needless to say, this is what we are taught in our master program. The master in data science is designed to boost the student's skill in searching for facts and knowledge among a wide variety of data, so to make educated decisions. We are trying we are trained to apply some of the best analysis methodologies available and uh, in using a wide range of instruments so that we will, be, we will be able to transform raw data into operational information that, uh, that can, of course, be used in general to have a more detailed and close view of reality. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Christian Ferri. Thank you. What an introduction, huh? That was about 15 minutes of introduction. I never get that pampered, so thank you. Well, it's such an honor being here with you all. So I just want to thank uh, Rebecca, the Dean, Nicola Buari for having me here. And uh, this beautiful university, driving up here with the beautiful hills overlooking Bologna. You guys are so lucky. How can you even study with this beautiful view? Are you guys studying at all? Or? All right. Um, can you hear me well? Fantastic. So I know it's 6 o'clock, right? You probably are tired after a day of work or studying, right? So I'm trying to... I don't want to be the guy between you and your family and your dinner, right? So we'll try to make it fun, quick, efficient, um, interactive. Um, you see this little guy behind me, he used to be 20 pounds lighter, that's me. So we're going to give a giveaway, three books to the people that are going to be the most engaged. So feel free to ask any questions, smart, stupid, there's no stupid questions, any sorts of questions you have in your mind. Um, and then we're going to coordinate some sort of giveaway, um, uh, three books, and hopefully you're going to be reading them and not using them as a doorstopper. So, all right. So let's move on. And um, I'm okay with doing interactive questions during the talk or we can do it at the end. It's really up to you. How you guys want to do it, okay? Sounds good. And then we need to figure out where to point this thing. Oh, it's moving. All right. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, blockchain innovations, right? So blockchain is a, um, just like Rebecca says, right, it's, um, it's a term that has been overused, uh, right? Everybody uses it for everything. Blockchain and this, blockchain and that, blockchain and toothpaste, blockchain and chickens, like everything, right? It's like the cure for cancer. Um, and the truth is that um, it's a lot of a hype unless you can answer the question, why? Right? Why should you be using blockchain and not a, a regular server, right? And so what I want to do today, just going to give a little overview of like what blockchain is. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the use cases happening across different verticals, right? And if you have some questions around a specific vertical that it's not covered in the slides, just raise your hand, throw me a rock, whatever you want. Just ask me the questions. We'll try you know, to see if we can cover that one as well, all right? Cool. 
All right, so Bill Gates, have you guys heard Bill Gates? Small guy in Seattle, created this thing called Microsoft. Blockchain is a technological tour de force. And it's interesting because remember that Bill Gates built an empire on a closed system called Microsoft. Blockchain is the exact opposite. So for Bill Gates to say something like that, it's pretty telling. Don't you think? You can nod your head. Yeah, you're alive. Yeah. All right, who's this guy? That was 20 pounds lighter, not 10. And I used to shave back then because I had a little bit more time. Right now, it's crazy. Um, anyway, I did a bunch of stuff in my life. Um, I've been in blockchain for about 10 years. Um, I, you know, I've been advising, consulting, uh, investing in the space. Um, and uh, so it's been, uh, it's been quite a great ride. Um, and I moved to the States about 20 years ago. Um, I was born in a little town near Venice called Conegliano. Uh, near, you know, and I realized that I really suck at singing and I suck at rowing. So I could not really become a gondolier. I decided I need to find a different job. So joking aside, uh, that's my story. And uh, I started doing some, um, some initial projects around blockchain and DLT. And, we, you know, if you read my book, you'll see, I, I like to say DLT, decentralized ledger technology, right? Which is the science of decentralizations, right? Within that, just like Rebecca was saying, you have blockchains, you have side chains, you have DAGs, um, you have smart contracts, cryptocurrency, and a bunch of stuff. So th the right way to say is DLT, but if you say to somebody DLT, they will look at you and say, what are you talking about? So uh, some of the early projects were done in back in 2014 for Walmart. We did a project, um, what was it? Food Trust to, what was it? To track pork out of China. They had a big uh, lawsuits back in 2013 for selling fake pork. It's not like they were selling fake pork, it's just some of the subcontractors in China, they were doing some crazy stuff. And so they needed a better way to, to increase transparency Right, none their supplier, which they have full transparency on, but the sub, the subcontractor. So not the contract, but the subcontractor and that. So that was interesting. Um, and then, then from pork, ended up kind of getting expanded to vegetable and the entire line. And now Walmart uses it basically for everything uh, inside China and outside China. Um, that's what I just talked about. DLT is basically the science that um, includes basically all the elements of DLT, right? Um, and obviously blockchain is the most well-known. Um, if you're familiar with layer ones, um, that's what they are. And then you have side chains basically are built on top to kind of improve efficiency. And then you have DAGs, which is a different new model that, you know, uh, Adera Hashcraft is probably one of the most well-known out there on the increased output and throughput. Obviously, a smart contract, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and way a lot more, right? We have oracles. We have um, oracles are a, an interesting way to to get data that is verified inside the blockchain because the, the blockchain doesn't verify any information, right? It just stores the information. But then if you get bad data in, it, you know, there's no point, right? So Oracle are a way to kind of basically get filter um, data that is actually uh, valuable, right? There's this point to kind of use it, in a sense, for people to kind of know about it, right? Um, so, yeah, so uh, let's think about, like, blockchain for the people that don't know. It sounds like that you guys are pretty um, knowledgeable about the topic, and I, I forgot to do it at the end. And raise your hands how many people have heard about blockchain before. Great. Raise of hands, how many people know about Bitcoin? Raise of hands, how many people bought a Lamborghini with Bitcoin? No, I should raise my hand. Um, okay, great. So we have a little bit of uh, knowledge. So think about like blockchain, what that means. is basically you have block and chain, right? Semantics, but block is basically the data, right? You have a container. And chain, what that means is that basically it's a system that is connected and I got to read these slides because I'm actually a little blind. Um, so what that means, that there's no data dead spots in a sense, right? There are more and better information, better decision making. Uh, you all have information in there, right? There's a lot of use cases around having the information right there and available 
to all parties that makes a lot of sense. Case in point, EMRs, electronic medical records, right? You know, your hospitals has the information, but then you get hurt in Cuba, right? Or Miami, right? If you can talk, great, but if you passed out and they have to kind of do a transfusion, how do you know your blood, you know, line or things like that? So having that connectivity is really important. It's distributed, so the advantage of that is that there's no single point of failure. You probably heard about Target being hacked or, you know, all these banks being hacked and they, you know, you'll go on their website, you type your information and they have like big bold letters and say, we safeguard your information with our life. We're never going to give away your information until a hacker comes around and actually steal it, right? So every centralized entity has a single point of failure. That's what blockchain is actually going against, right? It's a decentralized system where the information is actually chopped up, encrypted, and distributed out on a distributed system. So even if a hacker comes in to my computer, they would have only one piece of the equation, right? They would have to kind of hack all the other thousands of computers and be able to reassemble in the right order. It's just transparent. That's true and not true. Depends on what blockchain this. There's um, decentralized blockchain, there's private blockchain, there's distributed blockchain, right, which are more of a hybrid between the two. And that it's immutable, crystallized forever. Unless you have a 51% attack, which means that you have more than hashing power, in proof of work, in proof of stake would be a different kind of deal. But the point is that, technically speaking, um, it's immutable. So it's extremely hard to change the information on there. Does it make sense? You're still not pulling your hair, so I'm doing a good job, I guess. Any questions so far? Any thumbs up or hearts and love from the from the internet coming in? They're all good. Okay, good. Uh, why? Right? Why is a breakthrough? Well, let's read it. The blockchain lets people who have no particular confidence in each other collaborate without having to go through a neutral central authority. Simply put. It's a machine for creating trust. And actually, I think that's wrong. It's not a machine to create trust. Uh, it's a machine that lets you engage and do business or engage with a different entity to which you don't trust to still be able to engage in a deal. So it's not creating any trust. You're not trusting your, that company better. Right, you're able to kind of work with that company or that individual, that entity, but there's no trust, right? So be careful when you hear, oh, blockchain is a trust maker. Yeah, it's not, you know, love and puppies and flowers, right? It's just, <laughs> it's just business. <laughs> and all it's doing is just kind of verifying information, making sure that they can see certain things, you can see only certain things, and there's some sort of kind of connections between the, the worlds outside your firewall and outside their firewalls, whereas there's a point of contest, but nobody's sharing information. Everybody keeps that information, in a sense. Make sense? Great. Why are smart contracts a breakthrough inventions? Well, so it's an interesting question. Um, so smart contracts, They've been developed effectively by Ethereum, right, back in 2014, right? That was the whole point, adding smart contract capabilities to Bitcoin. Before Ethereum 2012, 13, there were some people kind of, you know, playing around that on the Bitcoin network. But effectively, Ethereum is what brought smart contract to life. And what a smart contract is, is basically a smart contract, right? It's basically a... Um, uh, Think of it as almost like a, a functionality, right? Um, a script built on a blockchain that allows you to basically do things based on an input and output function. So it says, if today in Bologna is 80 degrees, you know, send to Rebecca one Bitcoin. Right? She's going to be super happy. Uh, but if it's less than 15 degrees, you send it to somebody else, right? That's an example, right? Or they can process... Um, all sorts of functions, right? So they can, you know, obviously they can be used to, you know, uh, make complex payments like revenue splits, uh, for example, um, buying into a project. You know, you probably heard about ICOs or IDOs and things like that. 
um, you send the money to a smart contract, the smart contract, you know, splits that sum, that $100, say, across different, um, you know, uh, addresses, right, and sends to different people, and maybe returns back to you an X amount of tokens, right? So it has that kind of genie wizard functionality. Um, I, just, I, I realize that I'm giving a lot of attention to this guy, so don't feel like you're over, under, underserved. So I'm gonna put it like in the center like that, is that okay? Good. Um, so, so it has a lot of interesting functions, right? Um, and basically, you know, when you think contracts, it's not really a contract. It can be a contract, right? In the case of NFTs, when you sell NFTs, for example, you can add into the NFT, into the smart contract, the actual T's and C terms and conditions that those NFTs are going to be sold as. Um, you can add programmability and language. For example, you say you buy these things and then you receive a gift card. Um, you buy this you know, token, you receive this, or you transact with this entity. Or maybe it's external information, I will say, the temperature in Bologna or in Los Angeles, and then something else happened, right? So I have this kind of magic element to it that kind of amplify and expands the capabilities of both the blockchain and any sorts of token that it might be associated with. Does that make sense? Right, it's, it's not easy to grasp because it's very material in a sense, right? But think of it as almost like it's the logic element, right? So if the blockchain is where everything is written, the token is a form of you know, transactional value and the smart contract is something that sits on top of the blockchain that kind of creates that logic. It's almost like a, a digital being, like a cyborg, right? A digital being that says, okay, you want this, I'll give you that, right? If this is, then this. Think about an if-then statement. It gets a lot more complicated than that. I mean, there are companies that are using smart contract <clears throat> with the AI, with the DAO, decentralized autonomous organization, heard about it, the DAO, okay, to replace middle functions of companies. So there are enterprises that they, where they fire all the mid, mid, middle management and it's run by a DAO with a smart contract and AI that handles hiring, firing, performance decisions and any sort of kind of basic decision, which is scary because it's almost like Skynet, right? But just to kind of give you a feel that it's not about simple things, could be also about, and we all know like only the 0.5% of the things right now, there's a lot of stuff that has been developed that, you know, from, DARPA maybe, or like big secret organizations that we don't even know, we we'll probably know about in 20 years, and 30 years. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at how DLT is impacting uh, the globe, right? Both from a business, government, and society standpoint. So here's some, some verticals, right? Some examples. Uh, we're gonna go through the ones inside the, the blue square there. So supply chain, I think we talked about Walmart media, payment, fundraising, digital goods, so what's called NFTs, uh, ticketing, uh, counterfeiting, advertising, and you have a lot more, like uh, I can cover retail investing, you know, there are companies using um, uh, smart contracts and tokens so that you can basically uh, buy U.S. stocks if you don't live in the US, right? So basically what they do, they peg a token to a stock, right? Because right now, if you wanna buy Apple, you have to kind of have, you know, live in the United States or at least have a bank account and some social security, but you have to kind of be engaged with the United States, right? This allows you to disintermediate that element and say, look, you know, I live in Estonia or live in Italy or live in Spain, I want to buy Apple stocks, not through an ETF, but direct stocks one-on-one. -on -one. I buy the token that it's pegged, so which is tied to a specific stocks. And the more tokens I hold, the more stocks I hold. Makes sense? So that's part of the retail investing element. You have trade finance. Um, HSBC has a big uh, consortium of banks where they basically use blockchain to facilitate and make more efficient the trade finance. So think about shipping containers from big companies, right? Uh, being shipped around the world, you know, there's a cargo container waiting at the port. Um, it doesn't leave until you have all the paperwork signed, until the money is wired from the purchasing company. Well, who, who, who does what first, right? The money goes in first and they don't ship a container. They, they ship the container, they don't pay the money. 
And so how this thing has evolved is done through a smart contract that has a special escrow function. The money goes in once the, the dock, once the ship leaves the stations, and at a certain point, you know, you can use even GPS function to see where the ship goes halfway through it, past the halfway through it, the, half the money is wired, and the remaining wire is done once it reaches the port destination. So there's a lot of interesting things, and obviously energy. Um, and this is just interesting because right now with solar panels, um, is there a lot of solar panels and you know renewable energy here in Italy at all? Or yes, no, no wind, solar, no, just all coal. Woohoo, go coal! All right, it's funny. You know, I live in California, right, in Palo Alto. So by 2035, all the gas power, gas means benzina, right? The gas powered vehicles that will just can't can drive on it so it's only going to be electric so it's going to be an interesting challenge uh, but anyway so with, with energy you know you have your solar panels on top of your your your, your house right um, and then you can store their energy you say that you you make more than you consume so you can actually take that energy and sell it on a secondary market so maybe nicola is interested in you know buying that one for his company or whatever it is right and there's a comp there's a good friend of mine that's actually as a marketplace uh for that i forgot the name is like this long so uh, my memory is this short um so it's actually another interesting case. You can see how you can disintermediate, right? Right now, it's all about the grid and you know all this big energy company, but you can actually make money off your own energy that you build and sell it on a secondary market, right? You know, it's funny, guy. There was some some interesting things. So some of the Tesla um, station, uh, you know, Tesla, right? Uh, the, the charging stations are free, and so there were some folks that I think they were like charging the Teslas at the station because it was free the tesla stations and then they were coming home and offloading that energy off a battery and reselling that on the secondary market greatest scam ever see i don't know if they got caught or got behind bars but it was like <laughs> brilliant who <laughs> seriously who got the time to think about this stuff it was another guy who was actually mining cryptocurrency using their tesla not kidding it was using the energy and the processing power of the vehicle. Can you imagine? Like, you know, I just bought a Tesla. Oh, to drive it? No, no, just to mine, mine cryptocurrencies. It's awesome. I should build a company like that. Anywho, um, all right. So, well, we talked about IBM, right? Oh, it went over. I think it's just that. It's like whack-a-mole. You're trying to make a stop. Is it stopped? Good. All right, so yeah, we talked about IBM. Um, so food trust, supply chain tracking, classic use case for, for blockchain, right? Um, and so the way it works there is basically that um, either you have sensors or human inputted data records during the, the supply chains or the value chain, as to say, that, you know, from the, from the farm when you have the cows or the pigs all the way to the you know slaughterhouse all the way to the cleaning uh the chopping the packaging the distribution and the retail space right so there's there's some sort of kind of record that is presented uh, all the way down and it's funny because a lot of this information is actually started to be just for companies, right? So Walmart was interested in this information from a purely like compliance standpoint. But they then realized that this information is extremely valuable to analyze uh, uh, fault error tolerance. So what that means is that, um, you know, if the, you know, if some of the batch has an E. coli, uh, it's, it's germ or virus, I forgot one of the two, but e you know, e, e. Cola, e. Cola. So it's bad stuff. Like when you eat like your salad, like you're gonna, you're gonna run to the bathroom for a month, right? For a, for a week. So you, you're able to kind of capture, instead of kind of recall hundreds of thousands of products, millions of products, you're able to kind of go backwards and figure out where that, you know, E. Cola was actually started from. So you have a very uh, 
your specificity in the supply chain to kind of recall just that. And then obviously you have to kind of dig down deeper and figure out what happened there, right? So it's almost the aftermath, right? You have to kind of fix the problem so it doesn't happen again. So, so that was the other functions. And then um, one additional thing is that they realize that actually consumer care about knowing where their products come from, right? So it's not just about backwards, but also forward, right? So I love to know where my chicken is coming from, right? I love to know where my Gucci bag comes from, right? If the letter is genuine or not. You can think about that. So blockchain is not just a system of records for companies to have internal, you know, compliance, recognitions, and governance, but also for consumer, primary consumers and the secondary consumer, especially when we talk about luxury goods, because luxury goods is really big and for certain verticals, including luxury, right? Um, to be able to have that information, because once you have that information, you know, you can make better informed decisions. And if the product allows it, you can actually transfer the product to another buyer that is actually, you know, it's going to pay you more because now all the information has been guaranteed and certified and been tracked throughout the value chain, the, the, the life cycle of the product. Does that make sense? Good. Next. All right, media attribution, Spotify. So I think Spotify was sued uh, a few years ago because they forgot to, or they, not that they forgot, but they didn't, they were not keeping royalty records of their artists in a proper way, right? I don't think there was um, bad intent there. Um, but just, it's very hard. Think about Spotify, how many artists you have, like millions of artists, right? And so basically they needed a system that would not only um, code, those information somewhere and store them, right? To make sure there was not inconsistency. Hey, you know, you said 15, I actually have 12. But also a way to automatically spit those royalty as payments come in, right? So as people pay, you know, 19.99, 29.99, 59.99 a month, you know, that amount gets, you know, credited into Spotify and then split automatically across all the different people in the value chain, whether the record label, um, production label, artist, manager, and so on, right? And it's done automatically thanks to smart contract, right? So as you code the smart contract, you're able to say if 10 bucks, if whatever amount comes in, I'll give, you know, 20% to, what's your name? Max, 10% to Max, what's your name? Gabriele, and 10% to... Emanuele, and I'm going to keep the 70, but no. <laughs> so you get the sense, right? So you have all these the capabilities. And again, this is a very simple, lame example, but the complexity, once you have a, thousands of actors, right? And all it takes is like one, you know, the, the, the weakest leg, right? And then you get sued. And then you guys show up on Forbes as the company being sued because you don't pay the royalties and the media spins that up the way they want it because they need to sell the paper. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, great question. Um, so the question is why blockchain was used here instead of a regular server, for example, right? So remember the beginning what we said, right? Blockchain, the, 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 the case for blockchain is when you have to deal, when you have to work with a person, an entity, a government, an institution outside your firewall. So outside your company, that you do not trust or you have no reason to trust, okay? So let me specify, he's looking at me and say, say you gotta say. Um, so in that case, right, think about like Spotify works with like Universal and works with, you know, Capital Records and works with this and works with, you know, I don't even know who they work with, like all the major media company, I imagine, right? And then you have Lego label, production label, you have the artist, you have the manager. So they work with all these entities that they don't necessarily trust. They don't want to share, like, you know, that data, right? Um, in terms of what is coming in, how it's coming in, because it's their business, right? All they need to say is that, look, this is the check that is coming into you. You follow me? They don't have to know how much money Spotify is making, correct? They just need to say, here's the check. 
just, that's it. And he doesn't have a check. So that's the reason why, right? Basically to, to permeate, to exclude from all your backend processes and information, all the stuff that you don't want to share with the other one, just going to share whatever you want it. And on top of that, it creates an immutable record, right? And so immutable record that they might have the ability to audit, right? Depending on the contrast to say, we have to audit every three to six months. So at that point, they'll be able to kind of show that information. But you know that using blockchain, that information is actually immutable. So it's not like, oh, did you calculate it well? Show me your calculation. It's like, okay, it's coming in through the blockchain and this is a certification, the certificate. Uh, and they can actually send them a link to the blockchain that shows all the, all the amount of, so it's, it's not like they're calculating anything. They're literally showing it on the blockchain, how many people transfer their money into that wallet or account and so on, right? Now, Spotify has said fiat, right? So I think euros and dollars and things like that. I don't necessarily know how they, they, they input that into the, the blockchain element to it. So how they recognize revenues and how they, you know, how they're able to kind of do that in the blockchain. Um, but that's the way to do it. So then we have payments. All right. So JP Morgan, uh, have you heard of JP Morgan? Small bank. Cool. Um, so they, 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 they're thinking about a coin. Oh, I was like, I've been talking for a half hour. I've been talking for a half hour. I have to kind of wrap it up. Just like wrap it up. Like at the Oscar, right? And you come in and say, oh, thank you for these amazing awards. And right? And after three seconds, you hear the music. It's like, get the heck out of the way. Uh, is there music? Maybe. Um, all right. So, so JP Morgan Coin, very simple, right? I mean, they're thinking about uh, cross-border payments, right? Um, between banks, because obviously between JP Morgan um, subsidiaries around the world, among different group of banks, a group of circle of banks, obviously, and, and obviously remittances. Remittances means that you have a, your friend in you know, whatever country you want and you want to send them some money and so on. So, so we're thinking about creating this JP Morgan coin. I don't know if they did it or not, uh, but I know there was a big talk about it. And a lot of this company, they say something, they don't say anything. Sometimes it's for marketing purposes. Sometimes they actually do it, but they don't want the competition to it. So we'll never know <laughs> until we know. So that was an interesting thing that comes out of a bank, right? So again, second clue, Bill Gates tells you that the blockchain is amazing and it comes from a closed ecosystem. And Jimmy Diamond, CEO of JP Morgan, goes, let's build a coin. Why? Because maybe crypto has more better functionality than fiat. If you think about uh, money laundering, 99% of the money laundering happens with cash right you want to remove money laundering remove the cash and just force everyone to use a digital currency everything is trackable and that's what countries are doing are creating their own government backed digital currency owned by the government but is trackable so i know how much i'm paying you 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 they know how much how many taxes you guys have to pay but it will take some time. Why? Because there's a lot of people that would like to pay cash, especially the elderly people. My solution in that case would be remove all the cash, implement a digital currency, and for the people that want to pay cash, just give them a little card, like a prepaid card. When to have to go to the store, when they have to go into the subway, when they have to pay the taxes, they just use the card and it's tracked. So that's an idea. Plus, it costs a lot of money to to print money, think about it. A lot of paper, a lot of trees, no? Right? And I don't use cash. I don't have cash. So, you know, a lot of people say, hey, buddy, you have a dollar? I said, if you accept credit cards, take my credit card. I don't have a dollar. It's unfortunate. All right. Listen, just, uh, just uh, an observation. It is very strange that you pick up uh, the example of banks because <laughs> the movement uh, was. Uh, uh, created to eliminate banks <laughs> yeah. and again banks so how is blockchain reshaping the role of banks because it is quite interesting this yeah transformation. I mean, yeah I think it's more than that I think it's 
and I'll address that question. I'm not trying to kind of shrug it off. I'm saying that, you know, human beings are an interesting animal, right? Because, you know, the concentration of power, right? If you put a human being in a position to gain power, right, things change. Right? No, everybody thinks about, like, government is evil and banks are evil. We gave them that power, period. And we didn't know. It's not like we're stupid. Just we didn't know. I don't want to get philosophical, right? Somebody has some interesting question about this. I'm happy to kind of have a coffee chat or a glass of wine or tea. Uh, but going back to the banks, I think it's interesting, right? It's just <clears throat> banks have been around for forever, right? I think the Medici Bank, before we said that we had more banks, before formalizing the Medici Bank, um, uh, they've been around forever. They, they run the economy, right, effectively. And so they realize that digital currency have properties that might be actually quite helpful for a lot of things. Uh, first, they're much cheaper than transferring anything else, right? They can be faster. They have programmable benefits, so you can program the money to be paid if and when escrow. We talked about trade finance. And so they know that they have to catch up and right? implement these things. So if, eventually, I think, you know, it's going to be one of the two things, right? Either they're going to be able to catch up and provide a, a service that is going to be aligned with what the new society would like to see, or they're going to go out of business. It's a very unlikely scenario that they're going to go out of business, but it's also true that, you know, it was an unlikely scenario that Wachovia and Bear Stern and Lima Brothers, too big to fail, remember? So... We never know until we know. Um, fundraising. How many people have heard about ICOs? Great. How many have bought into ICOs? All right. Do you guys make some money? Yeah, the guy said, I got my Lambo outside. Yeah. Um, so, so, so here's the thing, right? So, uh, when Ethereum came out, Ethereum said, okay, we're going to launch this project. We're going to issue a currency in exchange for dollars, real dollars. And so this started a movement in 2014. We'll say, okay, it's a sort of crowdfunding. Instead of, you know, receiving, you know, a, a T-shirt, a hat, or maybe equity crowdfunding, maybe receiving stocks, you get this little token, right, which is easier, faster than receiving equity kind of thing. And so they did that totally unregulated, not knowing whether, you know, it would be okay, would not be okay. But it's an interesting way to kind of raise money. I forgot if they raised 7 million or 17 million, something around that ballpark. So that made you massive news, right? So you can see there's a slide that I have in another deck that I present sometimes. This spiral out of control of all the fundraising being done. You see 2014, like, this little bubble, it shows the bubble over time, right? The bubble point up and you see this bubble that is Ethereum. And then you see all this 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, like you see all this massive bubble, like, you know, and Ethereum is like this small, like you see Tezos raising 300 plus million dollars. It was like massive, like so much money being raised. And it was a little craziness. A lot of people say like, you know, why are we giving this money to these people? It's, I think it was a generational change, right? Much easy to, you know, to, to send money and receive some sort of kind of validation through a token, hoping to make money, speculation. Even if people don't tell you, that's the reason why people buy into SEO in the first place. I'm not the first one to tell. And it's not financial advice, so don't quote me. I don't want to get sued. Please, thank you. Um, so, so they serve as a way to kind of raise funds for projects. Yeah. Uh, do you have a mic? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so all I have to say is that they've been used to raise funds. So very simply, there are projects out there that they want to build something. Um, and uh, they say, look, you know, we're going to issue a bunch of tokens um, that represent, a, um, say, a ownership into our ecosystem. And with this token, you can do, you can access our ecosystem, you can, you know, participate into the benefits of the token going up and down. If it's a non-stable token um, and so that was the beginning and people kind of really flocked to it and then from there we had the IEO uh, which basically the same thing of an ICO but done from an exchange so instead of being an entity it's an actual exchange uh, market exchange where there's different cryptocurrency and they actually run the sale of these tokens 
the STO, which are securitized token offering. I'm on the board of a lottery. So they did an STO back in 18, 19, I believe. Um, unfortunately, there's no infrastructure built yet for security token offerings, right? So it's a new thing, um, but that's the most legal thing, right? Because it's actually, it's an actual security. But at that point you go IPO, right? So these are all the different functions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it on? Okay. So it's a question related, and it's perfect that you've been included in STO. So it's a question related because we've had problems. So I focus also in tokenization advisory, and we had a lot of problems with because there's been a lot of manipulation in terms of um, people when they launch their ICOs. Um, uh, obviously, regulation asks, okay, what is the purpose of this token? Is it utility or is yep. it a security? Yep. And so there's a clear distortion and they're mixing it up. And you can see a clear example like when Binance, I don't know if you know, when they started launching, oh, we're going to make a token for Tesla, we're going to make a token for Microsoft. And then I hold on right there and stop about that because you're mixing up concepts, which is utility and uh, a security. Mm -hmm. Appreciation in a secondary market and a utility within transactions. So, like, you can buy a Tesla car from me, the Tesla company, so Elon Musk said, you can buy a car from me just paying me in Tesla coins, like JP Morgan doing its own tribal ecosystem. Yeah, so, so okay, so I think there's two questions there, right? Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of kind of, uh, I'll start from the last one, right? It's like a brand theme coin, right? You have the Tesla coin, the all these different coins that are, that are big names, right? Obviously, the most famous one, I think, is so rare for soccer, by the fan engagement token where you have Milan. In fact, Christian, sorry for Yeah. Can you just make a, a quick, very quick distinction between what's utility, what's security token? Maybe utility and security, yeah. you said? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so basically, and this is actually a very important point from a legal standpoint, right? Um, so there are tokens that have some sort of use. So a security token is simple. It's just a security. It's just something that you buy to make money like a stock, that's basically what it is. There's no utility, you buy your stock, it's a piece of paper, in this case it would be a piece of digital paper that you buy to make money. And so there's been a lot of debate around the world around what are these tokens effectively. If they have no use, should they be a security instead, instead of being called utility token where reality have no utility. And the problem is that currently there's no framework or it's been developed, right? We have something in the United States at the SEC level, we have something called the Howey test, right? So it's a way to, to figure out, there, I think there's three, four different steps to help you, but it's data from the 1929. I'm not joke. This, this Howey test, the SEC has not developed a new test since 1929, right? Um, think about how many donuts and coffee you have to drink and eat right, for 100 years. Uh, and, so, and, so, and so they said, well, you know, there was a lot of, um, uh, I think I messed it up. I don't know if there's a way to kind of get it back to what it was, but whatever. So basically they say, uh, if it's not a, if it doesn't have utility, like this might be security, so they start suing a lot of projects that had no utility, right, or presumed their utility. And, suing, and this project were suing back and said, no, we have utility. You see, you can use this token and log into our platform. Is that utility? Um, oh, you can, you can buy processing power or storage power from our system with that token. If you don't have that token, you can't. So automatically it's a utility. And the SEC is that why can't they use credit cards, right? And so you start getting into this like gray area where there's no framework, everybody's saying what they want. So those days, I was doing quite a bit of consulting in a lot of companies, it was the wild, wild west. I mean, literally, people kind of, uh, you know, moving out of the United States because the United States tends to be like more of the, the you know, the lofty one, the one that really kind of aggressive going after you and kind of putting you to jail. So they're just moving outside the United States and kind of live in Gibraltar or Malta and things like that and just kind of run their token sales, right? And they grow a mustache, change a name, and just hope not to get caught anymore, basically. Uh, but so, so that's what it is. It's basically, like, the difference is that, you know, is it an investment vehicle or has utility to use some sort of kind of services or platform, okay? And then the relation to uh, uh, 
uh, company branded token is that, you know, the question is, okay, who owns the IP and then is that a utility or an investment vehicle? Has the company approved that? You know, I can tell you that working, uh, my company works with large companies. I have now seen one company that wants to have crypto in their balance sheets yet. Okay, there are very few in the world, you know, obviously Tesla, obviously Visa by Bitcoin and things, but the majority no, they don't. So it's risk, right? Um, so that, that's some sort of kind of things. And then and security STOs are basically token that are, are, you know, security. So instead of kind of trying to grow a master's and live in Malta, right? I have nothing against Malta, beautiful place, by the way. So if somebody from Malta, don't shoot me. Um, you, you just go to the SEC and just say, I'm fining for an S1, here's a security token, and then, I'm, you know, it's a token, which means that it's faster, cheaper, and more efficient than just paper stock. So it's more about the efficiency element and the, the programmability. You can add, you know, um, um, dividend splits. It's more from a te technology function, if you will. But unfortunately, there's no infrastructure. So I think back then, I think it was open network. Or, uh, open finance, I think it was called, which was like a market, a secondary marketplace, I think, for um, SDOs. But I think they went out of business. And then my good friend and friends, Jamie and Carlos, they run Securitize. Have you heard about Securitize? Okay. When they run, you know, they actually create SDOs for people. So I don't know how many people do it nowadays, right? Because you might as well just find an S1 going IPO. You know, right now, if you can do a SPAC, there's a lot of SPACs. You know how SPACs works. They, they're 18 months and then they raise a bunch of money. If they, they're not able to go public, they have to give the money back. So now they're coming to aspirations. If you don't find a partner or a company to bring IPO, they have to give the money back. So they're very incentivized to bring company IPO, right? That's why if you, on your Facebook feed, you see all these people going IPO and say, what the heck is happening? Everybody's getting rich and I'm not. Um, so that's the reason why. So I think there's a lot of hype around that, right? Either you go IPO or you launch a token that has true utility. Everything else in between is ah, wiki walky. I hope that answers your question. Did? Okay. Oh, forward. All right, great. So we have uh, digital goods and collectibles. Let me see if I'm able to kind of go back to what I was. I will never find a way back. That's okay. Um, so yeah, digital goods and collectibles. So you probably... NFTs? Who bought an NFTs? Yeah, it's all the same. What's your name? What? Borhog. Borhog. Okay. Nice to meet you. Um, so, so, yeah, NFTs, or what are the NFTs? Very simply, all right? I'll show it to you. An NFT is an ID, a unique identifier, okay? You know what an ID is? Okay. That ID is connected to a record, okay? I didn't say asset, I said record because it expands the type of use cases you can do. If I say asset, you start thinking about digital photos and music. If I say record, you start thinking about anything, like a file, a document, your identity, you know, your, your blood type, things like that. So a record, that could be an asset, but a record is a bigger, you know, um, cluster. So it's an ID connected to a record, a photo, a video, music, a VIN number, your, your blood type, whatever it is and connect it, and then record it on the blockchain, on an immutable ledger. And so you, as the owner, you can recall this record right, from the ID. So you say, okay, this guy is actually can access this ID, and this ID is connected to this record. So down and this way. Make sense? That's all an NFT is. It's just a way to connect records. How is blockchain different from NFTs? Well, the blockchain is a record, the NFT is something on top of it that you can actually transfer that has programmatic capabilities, right? So yes, it can authenticate like blockchain, but you cannot move the blockchain, right? It's almost like a password. You can transfer that out. You can program it with smart contract, right? So let's say that I, I own a, a vehicle. This vehicle comes with, you know, um, an NFT, for example, and then it say every time that that vehicle is resold, right, the passport is given to the new owner, and the company is so good that wants to be friendly with their new owners. And so at the moment that they receive the passport from an NFT on their phone, they get an exclusive video 
or an exclusive invitation to a dinner, or an exclusive invitation to a drop or a, a digital concert in Fortnite, right? So that programmatic capabilities allows them to do that because the company doesn't know when they sell the car, but the smart contract knows because when it changes hands, they can trigger that counter response. Make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah, no. So I'm really curious because it, maybe I'm just crazy, but I'm noticing the fact that, okay, people associate NFTs just with art and with collectibles and all this and that. But in the end, you can just, it's just a way to like have a digital representation of an asset, right? Could you call it that way? Could, for example, could, could you say that a company in, f to have a easier way to trace, for example, their buildings and to connect whatever happens in the real life in their buildings, could they connect it? I don't know, all these things that they're inventing that you can connect in real time data, fast through smart contracts, this and that. Can, can you easily move around that building focusing just on the digital representation you made? For example, you wanna sell the, the, the building, so what you say, okay, I'm just gonna send this to this address and that's about it. And he has all the records and everything stored yep. in there. Yeah, it's like a passport. Yeah, yeah. yeah Fortunately, yeah. exactly. when you said representation, it, I'm I'm new to this. So like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. What I'm saying is, it's not a, a tool to represent. I mean, okay. it's it, it representations. I don't want people to kind of think it's, it generates, it creates art and stuff like that. It doesn't, right? It takes your art, yeah, yeah, yeah. your title, your deed, yeah. your blood type, your identity, yeah. your your real estate, whatever your software license needs, yeah. everything that needs to be authentic, yeah. trackable, digitally scarce, yeah. so unique. Yeah, in the end. You yeah, can say my, 101, my, 10 or 10. Yeah, yeah, like my building has like three scars and I know that only my building has those three scars. That's just making an easy example. No, it's fine. It's, yeah, yeah, but so effectively the NFT is something that is different than blockchain, right? So it's a record, but then it's, that it's authentic, yeah, 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 and then it's movable, so I can transfer it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Can be programmed, mm -hmm. right? As we say, uh, and it's digitally scarce, which means that whoever mints this NFT, right, whether it's a picture or an information, whatever, they can say, look, of this identity, there's only one, right? Uh, but of these software licenses, there is only one, because each software license is different. Right, but of these, whatever, whatever it is, right, of these collections of, you know, Ronaldo's pictures, there are probably 10,000, but they're all unique, in a sense, yeah, yeah. the badge. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, I still have a lot to do to understand it, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. We, maybe we can catch up after the call, if you uh, okay. after yeah. the, the talk. Yeah, yeah happy to. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, yeah, well, ticketing, obviously, right? So we're now on... Uh, talking with a, with a ticketing company about, you know, some of the use cases. And there's a lot of use cases around, there's a lot of benefits of using NFTs and blockchain with tickets, obviously. One is it costs less, because obviously you're turning paper into digital. I mean, it sounds silly, but it's already like a big cost saving, especially when you think about like the, the logistics you got the printing, like the design of the ticket, the printing, the distribution, the, the sale, the disposal, because once you have the ticket where you put it, like somebody's gonna have to pick it up. So, versus digital. The second thing is that counterfeiting, right? There's a lot of counterfeiting tickets and so on, right? And thirdly, the, the analytics. You know, once they send it to the first user, how do they know, who, you know, in the secondary market of tickets, who buys it, who doesn't buy it? And fourthly, the programmability. Now that you have the ticket, you have a pass. It's not the end of your journey with me, it's the beginning of an experience that you'll have before, during, and after the event, the concert, whatever it is. So they can add experiential element, rewards, incentive, go buy this Coca-Cola for 20% off, but if you scan the receipt to this merchandise, you're gonna get this, and then if you do that over three Justin Bieber concert, I don't like Justin Bieber, uh, you will get 
level one, you'll be part of this exclusive club that you'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. And if you build, like, you get the, the gamifications there, right? So there's a lot of interesting flexibility that NFT can have on the ticketing world. And I'm trying to speed things up because I like to talk. Uh, well, counterfeiting, same thing, right? So supply chain tracking, how do we know that the letter goods from LVMH, from Louis Vuitton are actually, you know, legitimate, right? So you're going to have your bill for $20,000 you know, Louis Vuitton bag, um, and then you can say, hey, it was actually manufactured here in Turkey, but it's Louis Vuitton, and it was transferred to the store in Milan, and you bought it for 20000 and then you resell it, and whoever gets it back sees that it's legitimate, maybe had a similar restoration or repair at the store. Um, there's a lot of kind of fitting. So, you know, you go buy a Louis Vuitton bag, a Rolex, say, show me the NFT. Show me the NFT. If they can't show it, it means it's not, it's not legitimate, right? So it empowers you to get legitimate and, 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 and legitimate products, real products. Uh, advertising, that's a long one. Oh, my God. Um, there's a lot of things that blockchain NFTs can actually do for advertising. First of all, um, they can authenticate the data right, especially marketplaces, um, when you have supply side and demand side, uh, buy and sell of ads in an automated way, right, some of them are transparent, some of them might not be transparent. So having this on a decentralized, you know, exchange that is based on the blockchain, you can always make sure that there's no funky stuff going on. Um, there's a lot more UK use cases that I'm not going to cover now, but you know, in a sense, this is one of them. Um, one step further, obviously, is the use of NFTs on you know, print or any sorts of like you know, digital media, whether your phone, computer, television, TV, right? Using QR codes that you can scan to access certain things, right? Certain NFTs or passes that allows you to engage with you know, some sort of kind of. TV shows or movies or some sort of brand that is advertising and then to get your, your information. So to push your more relevant stuff to you. And which is actually a really interesting model because the only one that is able to do it today is NAS, uh, I forgot this, uh, Nielsen Media in New York, right? So they pay a lot of money to people to be able to install over the top boxes on their TV so they can control what channel they're watching and so on, right? This way, you can advertise with a QR code or have a TV shows that pop up a QR code over the top. Hey, you want this chair, you want this clothing, or get this special deal, this box set. You can scan it, buy it, um, and you can buy that certificate, right? Whether it's a collectible, whether it's that exclusive offer, and they know who you are because you have their app. But it's all done in a, you know, you know, authenticated, certificated, programmable way. And obviously, govern, govern, um, governments, they are using blockchain for identity, taxes, real estate, deeds, vehicle transactions, um, and a lot more. I love the work is being done. Um, yeah, we're talking, Rebecca, about like how universities are using blockchain. So there is a field of study right now going on relating to authenticating and sort of define um, uh, accreditations, so degrees and diplomas and things like that. Uh, not necessarily for you, because you trust the University of Bologna, do you, right? But it's about, like, let's say that you go to London, and then it's a mess, because then London uses a different system, and Bologna uses a different system, and they can't talk to each other, and then my wife, she graduated from med school, in Padua, and then she did a residency at UPenn, she did her fellowship at Stanford. That was a mess, right? So think about this one standard that people can agree on, it would be much easier. So that's one thing, identities, to make sure that the students are who they say they are. So you, you know, your passport, your NFTs could be your identity, that it's not somebody else. There's been, I think it was like a, a scandal with uh, with some students that were like 
pretending to be somebody else, and then they were taking exams, and they, f they found out. So now, if you're taking an exam, you, you know, the university knows it's actually you, and you're going to get the grades. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things happening, but, you know, grades and certifications and, and identities. Um, uh, we're working with, you know, UC Berkeley, for example, um, and a bunch of other universities for the NFT element, um, you know, uh, so they have a lot of, obviously, sports, esports, uh, you know, the, the logos, they have a lot of, like, things they can NFTs and sell, right, to engage younger demographics and generations, and I think it would be great to kind of do the same thing with the University of Bologna. You guys have so much history. Um, so we potentially could be looking at that as well. So that's my, the best slide. It's, I'm actually going to stand for this one because I like it so much. Can you hear me? Great. So this is actually the best slides that I, I think is that if you think about what we society looks like past DLT mass adoption? Um, DLT, you know what DLT is, right? Reputation is the highest value commodity. Why? Because if we live in a world where everything is tracked and trackable, right? You know, think about the black mirror. Do you guys know the black mirror? Everything is going to be tracked and all your actions are going to be tracked. So in the most dystopian future, we all know what we did. Scary. The good part of that is that weeds out the bad actor. So if you know that you're going to get recorded forever, right? You don't, you don't want to be the bad guy, right? You just want to kind of... So it's going to be a good thing. But at the same time, all, your, all our reputation is going to be on the blockchain. So if that's the case, that's a nice um, uh, show on, on Black Mirror about reputations, right? Where the society lives based on you know, the likes they get and things and the reputation they get. So that could be a function of what the blockchain and the, the, the trackable element of it can actually you know, make our society, in a sense, right? Turn our society into. Uh, uh, a new meaning to job, we talked about the DAO, right? And so if AI and DAO and blockchain are working together, we're going to have a replacement of middle management, potentially of all the companies. That's what uh, Elon Musk is alluding to, right? With robots and with AI and with blockchain and DAO, like you're going to have self-governing companies, self-governing uh, governance, uh, governments. So what are we going to do? Right? And that's the reason why he's hinting at the UBI, universal basic income, because once there's no jobs, everybody, you know, everything is going to be done by machines. You know, you're going to have something to live on. And I think humans will have to kind of find a different meaning in life. And then will it survive, right? Now we have AI. What if the AI takes over and through smart contract is able to kind of, you know, execute things, not just the thing, but execute, right? So the AI is the brain, and then you start having the DAO, right, that can execute on things, on the smart contract element. So now you have brain and execution start looking like a human. And the things, if it goes out of hands, what happened? Skynet. Who watch, who knows about Terminator? That's my, one of my favorite movies. Don't tell my wife. Um, and I don't know if this is the last slide or maybe. It is. So I probably have, I'm already late to a call, but if there's any questions, uh, let's say, let's take three questions and then you guys can email me. All right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, once the smart contracts reach its full potential, what will the role of lawyers be or notaries? <laughs> will they be replaced? Who? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, potentially, um, I think can law be codified? Yes. How long will it take? A lot of time. Uh, but law is always changing. So maybe lawyers are not going to be the one. Um, finding about the law, lawyers are going to be the people that are going to input and code that type of information into the blockchain for everybody to use. Because right now, lawyers, they're just very focused on their own case. But maybe lawyers can become the doctors that once you go to the hospitals with your passport, they already know your 
medical information because you have your passport, and they're the only one able to add information to your blockchain-based passport. So maybe that could be an interesting way for them to say, look, look, you know, here's the information, here's the law, right? So I have a case like that. Here's the information that, you know, I can find on the blockchain for stuff that has been done around the world. And again, you can know that country is working a little different, right? So we have a different way of law in the United States that you guys have it here, right? In the United States, more about precedence, sure. right? What hasn't been ruled for here is a little bit. But potentially, there could be more than just <clears throat> actors in their single case that could potentially add to the blockchain to help basically a larger community. So, um, yes. Zero knowledge uh, snarks. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. You're, you're uh, speaking a lot about. So it. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, of zero knowledge myself. You guys know what zero knowledge is. So zero knowledge means that <clears throat> um, when you think about blockchain, right, and you, it's basically a functions where you don't have to share your information. You own your passport. You own your data, right? There's a big movement around owning your data. And data, it's not just your name and age, but your preferences, where you live, where you worked in the past for the past 10, 20 years, where you were born, like your blood type, like anything. So you own that information. Right. I'm pointing my phone as a way to get into your data, not the fact that the data resides on your phone, because if this thing goes into the toilet, it's done. So it's a pass-through to the data. The data is stored on the blockchain. So even if you lose this one, it doesn't matter. You got a new phone, right? But zero knowledge means that if I need to get a mortgage at Wells Fargo, I go to Wells Fargo and say, hey, hi, I need a mortgage. Okay, and they're going to tell me, okay, tap here. And I tap with my phone, right? And there's going to be a sequence of scripts that if the outcome is positive, they're going to release me a mortgage. Is this person over 18 years of age? Yes, he's 32. Do they need to know that I'm 32? No. So all the things that you're filling out every time, think about how much data you're giving out to people. Does this person live in the continental United States? They don't care that you live such and such street and so on. Does this person make more than $200,000 a year? They don't need to know that you make $235,000 a year, right? And so that's the zero knowledge proof, is the ability to verify things without necessarily giving out the information. So I think it's, it's the future. That's where society is going towards. Remember, if there's one takeaway from this class, your identity, your information is the most valuable things that we have in society, okay? So far, nobody really understood it. That's why Facebook, Google, they took advantage of it. Do you wanna live in a society where you own your data, but you pay Facebook $9.99? Or do you wanna live in a society where you have free Facebook, but they steal and resell your data? Make sense? All right, so if there's only any questions, thank you very much. Just on Zoom. on Zoom, sure. Hi, Christian. Hello. I'm Fred. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Likewise. Uh, okay, I have a question about the first part where you talked about uh, money laundering. Okay. About what? Uh, the money laundering. Oh, money laundering. Okay. Yeah, sure. That, uh, okay. But uh, isn't the blockchain uh, anonymous and public? So why should the banks want a technology like this? I mean, isn't it easier to launder money with cryptocurrencies? And why should banks uh, do things transparently? We know that they don't do it. <laughs> so you're saying why governments would be okay for it or why people should be okay with it? No, governments, not people. Oh, governments, because it's, um, it's trackable. They can track all the flow of money. But the blockchain is anonymous. Uh, some blockchains are anonymous, like Monero okay. and so on. But, you know, I'm sure that governments will not want to have an anonymous blockchain. So the blockchain that governments are using for their own 
the government-backed cryptocurrencies are public blockchain? Well, I would say permission blockchain. So the public doesn't know okay. that I send the money to that person, but they know because they have okay. permission to do so. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. And I have a, another fast question yep. about NFTs when yep. you talked about Louis V. Yep. Uh, how can you certify that something is authentic with an NFT? I know that, for example, BMW are doing the same thing with their components uh, together with VeChain, the crypto blockchain, Chinese blockchain. And I don't understand how they can do it. How they can do it? Well, I'm not really sure how they, they can do it, but I think it it's really depends on, you know, the type of use cases that you have in your hands and, you know, what is the best technology that you have at the time. Remember, this is a very evolving space, so technology evolves all the time, right? So even if I respond to you today, you know, in three months is going to be different, right? Six months. So sure. happy to chat a little bit more after the call, but I really got to jump on a call so <laughs> that I'm late okay. for. Sorry. Awesome. Folks, thanks again for all the questions. If Thank you have you. questions, um, feel free to reach out. And if you stop by in California, let's go grab coffee. Thanks very much. <laughs>